Hello everyone, and welcome to your complete and ultimate Mona guide. Mona is one of the oldest characters in the game, and being on the standard banner, she's very commonly obtainable even to this day. As such, this video is to hopefully guide any current or future Mona owners on how to roughly build and play her. This video will cover all of the following in order. General playstyle, talent overview, weapon options, artifact sets and stats, team comps, constellation overview, and an Abyss 12 showcase all in an as condensed manner as possible. Most of this video will be recorded on my main account, Mona, but some of it will also be done with my free-to-play account, which is much lower investment. As such, that should serve as a good reference for both newer and higher investment players. With all of that out of the way, let's get right into the guide. Mona is primarily a support character who relies on her burst to massively increase the damage of her team's on-field DPS. While she can be used in a lot of new teams, her most common use is generally in freeze teams such as with Ayaka or Gan Yu. Her skill allows for off-field hydro application with decent uptime, while her burst is a massive damage boost for a short period of time. Because she is fairly burst dependent for her support potential, she is reliant on energy recharge in her build for permanent burst uptime. In freeze teams, Mona has been somewhat power crept by Kokomi due to her weaker hydro application as well as lack of healing, though she does offer better damage with her burst. However, Mona is much more easily obtainable and also still the only other option for decent AoE Hydra application aside from Kokomi. It's also important to note that while Mona's role is typically relegated to a support, she is also a burst DPS archetype, which means she should still be built like a normal DPS. For those wondering about main DPS Mona, it's uh pretty bad. <laughs> her normal attacks are clunky, and her skill doesn't do much damage. She is practically completely reliant on her burst, which is only a very short window of DPS and thus not very sustainable for overall damage. Like with anything in this game, it obviously can work, it just isn't a very good playstyle for her kit. Finally, I want to briefly touch on Mona's Bloom playstyles. Because Mona is not a very fast off-field Hydra applicator, she will not work as a solo Hydra character in Bloom teams unless you use her on-field. She has to be paired with another Hydro teammate if she's not going to be the on-fielder, but even in that scenario, Mona is typically a downgrade from other characters like Sing Cho, Yelan, and Kokomi, who can all fill the role while offering better utility. Mona is one of those characters that is rarely the best in slot character in most teams. She's decently flexible thanks to being Hydro and a strong buffer, but she still falls behind in terms of overall support potential these days. However, she is still pretty much essential for freeze teams who don't have Kokomi, and is still great for landing that big damage per screenshot. Starting with Mona's normal attack talent, Mona does 4 total hits, though keep in mind that the last hit has a very long animation, so it's pretty much never recommended to finish the whole string. Her charge attack is pretty standard for a Catalyst user, consuming a ton of stamina and dealing AoE Hydro damage. If you happen to be playing a main DPS Mona, which I'm going to be guessing is very little of you, then this talent will become your highest priority to level. Her charge attacks in particular will likely be your main source of damage, especially if you perform a vaporized reaction. For pretty much any other Mona player though, I do not recommend leveling this talent at all since you will almost never use her normal or charge attacks. Mona's elemental skill creates a taunt that stays on the field for 5 seconds. It deals hydro damage every second before exploding at the end of its duration. This is Mona's primary way to apply off-field AoE Hydro. It ticks 4 times which has standard ICD, meaning that only the first and third ticks will apply Hydro. The explosion at the end has no ICD, so in total, this skill will apply Hydro 3 times throughout its duration. Unfortunately, it does have a fairly long cooldown of 12 seconds, which means you will have 7 seconds of downtime. Because this skill's damage is fairly low and its main purpose is for Hydro application, I don't often recommend you level this talent much, but it is fine if you want it to deal a little bit more damage. This skill does have a hold version, which makes Mona move backwards while leaving the taunt behind. However, due to the much slower animation of the skill, as well as lack of auto-targeting compared to the tap version, this is almost never recommended to be used. One final thing to note, Mona will only generate Hydro Particles if the explosion at the end of the taunt's duration hits an enemy, in which case it will generate 3 and occasionally 4 Hydro Particles. Mona's elemental burst is quite complicated and the most important part of a kit. Firstly, when Mona casts this burst, she will mark enemies hit by it with her illusionary bubble as well as omen. We'll go over each one separately. First discussing her illusionary bubble. You can tell an enemy is marked with the bubble when they have this starry effect on them. When this bubble is active, smaller enemies will be raised in the air and be completely immobile. 
This bubble can pop in two ways. Any direct follow-up attack on an enemy that has been marked will pop the bubble. Or, if nothing is done after 8 seconds, the bubble will also pop on its own. On the initial cast of the burst, it actually deals no damage, and only does so once the bubble has been popped. One thing to keep in mind is that both the initial cast as well as the bubble bursting can apply Hydro, which is useful for certain damage nuking scenarios with Mona. However, because they share the same ICD, her nuke setup is overly complicated and absolutely not practical for 99% of players. Basically, to summarize, cast burst, make bubble, do damage, bubble pop, deals hydro damage. That is my caveman explanation for those who want a summarized version. Next up, arguably the more important part of her burst is her omen buff. When an enemy has been tagged by Mona's illusionary bubble, they will also have the omen status applied onto them. Omen does have a duration, namely 5 seconds after you are at talent level 8 and above. However, this duration timer does not start only after the bubble has been popped, which means that until you deal damage to an enemy that has the bubble on them, omen status will still be applied to them. This technically gives omen a maximum effective duration of 13 seconds. Enemies affected by omen will take significantly more damage, which scales a accordingly here with Mona's talent level. The damage increase is pretty significant, making Mona one of the best supports for amplifying small windows of front-loaded DPS. This is by far Mona's most important talent in pretty much every playstyle. This burst has a 15 second cooldown and a decent energy cost of 60, so you should try to build Mona with as much energy recharge as possible until you are able to get permanent burst uptime. We'll get into her ER requirements later in the artifact section. Next up, I want to talk about her sprint. Mona does have a different sprint than others, whereby starting her sprint will make her go underwater and applies Hydro onto enemies once she comes out of the dash. Her dash's Hydro application has standard ICD, so there's nothing really special there, but it is useful for constantly applying Hydro because her skill has significant downtime. The biggest caveat with this sprint is that it has a pretty slow exiting animation and her lateral movement is quite bad, so Mona might not exactly be the best on-field character to dodge with due to how clunky her sprint might feel. Finally, I want to talk about her passive talents. Her A1 allows her to create an extra set of her skill after dashing for more than 2 seconds. However, the taunt has a much shorter duration and deals less damage than her actual skill. This passive is practically useless. Her A4 is the actual good one though, granting Mona Hydro Damage Bonus scaling off her energy recharge. This allows her to run an attack percent goblet instead of a Hydro Damage one in certain builds, as there are often many ways to get other sources of percentage damage bonus. We'll get into this later again in the artifact section. <laughs> Mona's weapon options are quite wide for her support role, but pretty awful for her main DPS role. Firstly, I want to go over her main DPS options. The Skyward Atlas, Lost Prayer to the Sacred Winds, Kagura's Verity, and Too Late to Left Remembrance are all going to be your main DPS options. The biggest problem with this is that main DPS Mona is garbage, and all of these catalysts are also garbage. Lost Prayer needs you to stay on the field for more than 16 seconds to get the full buff, which is terrible. Too Late to Left Remembrance is okay for her normal attacks, but doesn't buff her charge attacks. And Kagura's Verity has a pretty incompatible passive with Mona's skill. Out of the bunch, Skyward Atlas is probably the least garbage and most flexible option but it's still not a very good weapon. Again, unless you absolutely want to play a main DPS Mona, I do not recommend any of these weapons. Finally getting on to her only 5 star support option, a thousand floating dreams is a good option but only if the team comp benefits from EM sharing, namely certain dendro teams like Hyperbloom or Nilu Bountiful Cores. Finally moving on to the actually good weapon options, my personal favourite on Mona is going to be the Favonius Codex. This won't work for everyone as it isn't the best for Mona's team damage capabilities, but it gives a ton of ER in its substat while providing energy to the whole team. Using this weapon also allows her to lower her own energy recharge requirements due to the frequent white particles and also run an attack percent sands for higher personal damage. For those who wish for Mona to have better personal damage, you can also use the Witsith. It has crit damage as a substat and a situationally good buff that is often better than any of the 5 star weapons. Though the biggest problem with this weapon is its comically long downtime. This weapon is okay, but I personally feel Mona's personal damage is not worth heavily investing into with this weapon unless you want to use her as a main DPS. In which case, this weapon still isn't that great on her due to the long buff cooldown. And finally, 
arguably Mona's best weapon, the Thrilling Tales of Dragon Slayers is the strongest option if you play with an attack scaling main DPS. While it has a useless substat and is awful for Mona's personal damage, oftentimes the buff from this weapon to a proper main DPS more than makes up for it. On my free to play account, I play a TTDS Mona with my Ayaka, as giving Ayaka that massive attack boost is a huge increase to DPS. Just like with Witsith though, this weapon does have significant downtime and also has certain fixed rotational requirements due to the way the buff works. Still, this is situationally Mona's best in slot weapon and a very low investment one to boot. Mona's stats are going to vary a lot depending on the level of investment and playstyle. I want to first cover the typical support Mona. No matter the level of investment, Mona's first and foremost important stat is going to be energy recharge for her permanent burst uptime. How much energy recharge do you need? Well, that depends on the team and weapon. If you run Mona as the solo Hydro character, you will probably need more than 220% ER to get permanent uptime. This will be higher or lower depending on whether you are facing single target or AoE scenarios. If you play with a weapon like Favonius Codex or have another Favonius user in the party, you can probably lower this amount to around 200% thanks to the extra particles. Next thing I want to cover are her crit stats. Are they important? The answer is yes. Mona may be a support, but she's also a burst DPS since her bubble actually has a decent damage scaling. While it is not as important as her ER, you should eventually build her with good crit stats since you can only fill her up with so much ER before needing to allocate other stat rolls, among which crit is the only meaningful one. You don't have to target amazing stats, but just enough to consistently deal good damage. My free to play account's Mona has a crit ratio of 60 to 118, which is not amazing, while my main account's Mona, which has much better artifacts, has a crit ratio of 70 to 143. As you can see, it heavily depends on your level of investment. For artifact main stats, her sands can be either energy recharge or attack percent depending on how you balance your stats, her goblet should usually be hydro damage, and her circlet should obviously be crit. If you play with emblem or run a low base attack weapon like the Thrilling Tales of Dragon Slayers, then you can also use an attack percent goblet instead, thanks to Mona's A4 making up for a ton of percentage damage bonus. You can just test it out for yourself, but usually a good attack goblet can outperform a worse hydro damage goblet. It really depends on the build path. Moving on to her recommended sets, Mona's sets actually vary a lot depending on how much you value her damage. Firstly, I'm going to recommend 4-piece Emblem of Severed Fate. The 2-piece bonus gives her additional ER, and the 4-piece bonus increases her burst damage by a ton thanks to Mona being built with quite a lot of energy recharge anyways. This is also a very resin efficient domain to farm thanks to many characters needing this set. Also, because of the huge amount of damage bonus you get, this set makes it much more viable to run an attack percent goblet. This set is the best balance between Mona's damage and support potential, but might not be the best option for either. Next up, we have 4-piece Noblesse Oblige. This is a good option thanks to Mona's constant burst uptime and providing a decent attack bonus to the entire party. However, this should only be used if you don't already have another Noblesse user in the party. Alternatively, 4-piece Tenacity of the Millilith is also a good team buffing option thanks to her off-field skill being able to proc the set bonus very reliably. This set becomes more impactful if it's stacked with another party member who is also carrying Noblesse. Finally, I'll talk about her main DPS sets. If you use Mona's charge attacks a ton, then 4-piece Wanderer's Troop is going to be a good option. However, 4-piece Heart of Depth or Nymph's Dream are going to be better universal options for general damage. Moving on to team comps, Mona is quite flexible wherever you need a damage buffer, so I will go over her popular team comps instead. Firstly, she is obviously a common option for Freeze teams thanks to her AoE Hydra application and off-field nature. If you play Freeze Ganyu or Ayaka, Mona is a very easy slot in, especially if you don't have Kokomi. Both her skill and her burst will be used to maintain Freeze uptime, but even in scenarios where you cannot freeze enemies, like against bosses, Mona's omen status from her burst is going to massively increase her team's main DPS damage. This is what sets her apart from Kokomi. Kokomi offers better Hydra application and healing in one, but Mona will be a better option if you want more damage, which in certain scenarios may be more favourable. It also helps that Mona is much more easily obtainable than Kokomi, so these freeze teams are often forced to use Mona if they don't have Kokomi anyways. For Dendro Bloom teams, I don't recommend using Mona as the solo Hydro character unless you also plan to use her on field. 
This is because her off-field hydro application is far too slow for bloom generation, especially due to her ICD. However, she is a good option if you play her with someone like Sing Cho or Ye Lan, who can offset her poor hydro application. Generally though, I still don't recommend Mona for most bloom teams since she doesn't really fulfill the role as well as Sing Cho, Ye Lan, or even Kokomi. She should generally be a last resort option if you somehow do not have those three characters. Finally, I want to talk about Mona outside of those previously mentioned teams. She can be used in nearly any team that has front-loaded big DPS windows thanks to her burst, such as with Raiden or Ito. However, she is really the actual best option for any of these teams. So she's more of a use her if you have to, but use someone else if you can kind of option. Mona's constellations are pretty low impact to her overall gameplay and thus not super valuable. Constellation 1, pretty self-explanatory constellation, though there are a few things to take note of. Firstly, the damage boost to Vaporize will not apply to her burst bubble damage when it pops unless you are in multi-target scenarios. The first bubble that pops will not get the bonus, but any bubble that pops afterwards will. Secondly, I'm unsure if this is bugged or not, but the frozen duration extension does not work. Like it straight up just doesn't work. Regardless of whether Mona applies Hydro first or is the one to trigger Frozen, the enemies do not get Frozen for any longer. This has been the case ever since the start of the game and as of the current version, still pretty much doesn't work. Constellation 2. Pretty self-explanatory as well, though the extra charge attack generated by this constellation does not consume stamina. Overall, pretty useless. Constellation 3 and Constellation 5 increase her burst and skill talents by 3 levels respectively. Pretty useless as they only increase Mona's damage. Constellation 4, easily Mona's best constellation, giving extra crit rate against enemies marked by Omen during Mona's burst. Really good for freeze teams in particular, especially if they are built with Blizzard Straya. Constellation 6. This gives Mona a maximum of 180% damage bonus to her charge attack if she sprints for more than 4 seconds. This constellation is absolutely useless. So yeah, as you can tell, Mona has some pretty bad constellations, which I think is a common mark of a standard banner character. Aside from her constellation 1, which is barely helpful, and her constellation 4, which is okay, the rest of her constellations are pretty bad. Finally, onto the Abyss Showcase. I will be using my free-to-play accounts Mona on the bottom half of Abyss 12 alongside Ayaka, Kazaha, and Zhongli in a standard freeze team. ま。
Thank you for watching this Mona guide. I do hope it was helpful, and I wish everyone the best of luck building her. Do check out twitch.tv slash as well, where I often stream Genshin Impact. Thanks once again for watching, and I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Take care.